you all for uh, joining today, and hopefully uh, um, I will not give you the anatomy of how a chip is actually constructed and all of the deep, deep technical details, but do want to give you an overview of what we see as a company. NXP provides predominantly, uh, I would say, a, a leading position in your passports, your bank cards today, in mobile devices, your NFC chip. Um, we're very much about security and connectivity as it moves from a card all the way to the devices, and that includes mobile as well as, uh, uh, as IoT devices are coming up. Um, we've got two great partners. So I'd ask you guys to come up right now. Kieran Fisher from Snowball Technology. Talk a little bit about what they're doing. Um, we wanted to move a little bit away from the traditional wallet uh, use cases, um, but we'd like to see also uh, James Elson from NIMI, uh, who also give an, an idea of how they're using some of our technology that, um, that's out there. So as I mentioned, we're, we're seeing a tremendous amount of growth in applications, not just in the wallets, the ones that get the press. You have Apple Pay, you have Samsung Pay, you have Chase Pay, you have MCX, uh, Alipay. Many, many new wallets uh, are coming at a very rapid rate. Um, just recently in China, I, thought, I think it was, Kieran, within a week, there were almost five major wallets announced right on the foothills of Apple Pay announcing their launch there. So very high profile, very high. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of applications, but it's predominantly focused on payment. And what we want to talk about today a little bit is some of the other emerging applications that we're seeing as a company, things like in the connected cars. So one of the things you're seeing more and more is your cars are getting smarter, not just for autonomous driving, but also around security and how that car could actually connect in the digital world. Um, things that are very traditional card-based world, that's things like payment, access, um, transit are three of the biggest um, industries that right now to NXP plays a very big role in supplying the cards. NFC is a great bridge technology which allows those same applications to move on to mobile devices um, in a secure way. So I want to just highlight a little bit, make sure we have time for these guys to talk about what they're doing. Um, just to try to give you a visual representation, by the way, this is as technical as it'll get uh, for me, is taking in, in, and Sherry actually from MasterCard mentioned it before, is taking what is a known, a, a, a secure core technology that moves from a card-based system to what you see in a mobile device today and later as you look to IoT um, transactions. Across the board, we see security as a fundamental thing that both consumers and businesses need. Um, things like HCE, which is emulating that, that secure element or the security chip that's in there, um, things like tokenization that was man mentioned before. All of these things really are leveraging the fact that you have connected devices and you have a, actually a lot more horsepower to drive techno technology. Um, but at its fundamental side, it's that embedded security chip that we see as the one that really drives leverage an existing known platform um, to enable different and new use cases. And again, that same chip is, is predominantly what's used for, again, payments, access, um, and transit as, as being the three big categories that are out there. Just to touch real quick again on the sort of three big ones, mobile payment, as we mentioned, that's clearly the one that gets the most attention, the biggest opportunity often seen. Um, I also would argue it's one of the biggest challenges because there are so many business issues or challenges around who owns the customer, is it the bank that owns the customer, is it Apple that owns the customer, is it Samsung that owns the customer. Um, We see a tremendous growth, and if you've seen it here at the show, and one of the use cases is around wearables. Um, and what, what I think is really unique about wearables is they're, they're much more devices that are being used. We don't see as many of the business model challenges with carriers and, ever, and other things. We actually are seeing, in some respects, more innovation on some of the examples you see up on the slide right now in terms of what you can do in terms of its specific use cases, whether it be fitness, whether it be a access band like you see on the Disney. Um, uh, those are the kinds of ones that we're seeing, again, the, the, the idea of having um, big business model challenges with that around, we're seeing it a lot less in wearables, and therefore I think we're seeing more use cases come at a, at a, at a more rapid rate. So last, and, and, and that I wanted to touch on a little bit of detail is, is around the area of transit. So, um, if you look at transit systems worldwide, predominantly there are contactless systems, uh, very much on our MyFare system. Uh, China uses a slightly different, but all very compatible with the technologies that we've talked about. And probably one of the biggest use case, when you think of 
many of the challenges with new use cases is it's the use. I think that's one of the reasons Starbucks has been so successful is, and I'm, I'm a big victim of that, I pretty much go there every day anywhere in the world, so using that application on a regular basis, transit becomes one that is actually very powerful in certain markets, and that's what actually Kieran is gonna touch on uh, when he talks one with his use case. Just wanna leave a few thoughts of, of uh, like I said, of what we've seen. Um, Sorry, it's not building up. Okay, I'm gonna tell you what's on the slide here. Um, is that how you do it? No, okay, fine. One of the biggest challenges that we're seeing is, is consumers' understanding of what the technology is. I think that is a, that's something, if you look at some of the wallets that have been released, where you have HCE, secure element technology, tokenization, Samsung is using MST, very, very different technology, different levels of security, all great applications, but very different tech, uh, ways of technology. Consumers are not always aware of exactly where that is, and I think the way we've educated consumers on the level of security, I've heard discussions in lines at different times um, where my wife will stop me from trying to go and correct the person's view of what chip card technology is. You've seen many, many wallets, as an example, that have the RFID protector. If you watch any of the commercials late at night, they'll say those are the ones. So many things, I think, that are slightly misrepresented out in the market in terms of technology, and I think that's one thing that, as an industry, we need to do a much better job of how is it that we can educate consumers as to why this is actually a much better technology. The other one that I see is um, the, the challenge is, is if anybody, how many have actually tried uh, Apple Wallet transaction, mobile? Samsung? Okay. For myself, and I, and I mentioned to somebody, probably the last 15 years have been working in the area of trying to bring um, contact, there it is, thank you, um, contactless technology. I still will walk into a store and I have a nervousness as to whether this place takes Apple Pay or not. Even though I know the terminal, I know it should do it, but the clerk's uncertain, the store's uncertain. Um, I think how we've educated the consumers as to how it works. If you go into, uh, in the US here at Whole Foods, it's probably one of the best implementations because it's very obviously it's accepted and their retail clerks actually know and are actually able to, to use it. And so, like I said, I think that's one of the areas. The last one, which is a great transition to um, these two gentlemen, is I, I think we're not focused much on activation. So we, we do a great job in launching these things, but what are we doing really to try and make activation, that people actually use it? And I go back to, again, many of the wallets were great implementations, but we're not taking that last step to make sure it's very user-friendly, it's very easy to go in, people understand it. Um, I scared my the local restaurant, um, Italian restaurant, finally went in for takeout, noticed that the terminal next to it, I thought, would actually accept it. And he said, no, it doesn't, this was the owner. And I said, do you mind if we just try? He knows me, walked over and, and it worked. And so they have accepted Apple Pay. He said he had the machine for over nine months. He's had the capability to do it. He didn't even know that it was accepted. And so I, I think, again, it, it doesn't take a lot, but if we had done a better job to make that clear, just to the staff alone that they actually accept it, um, I think we could have done a lot better. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Kieran Fisher from Snowball Technologies. Um, to tell us a little bit about the, uh, the market of, of transit in China and what they've been doing. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Kieran from Snowball Technology and I'm going to um, talk about uh, what, what Jeff asked me to talk about, which is he said, come here and talk about something big and real, and the topic is going to be China, and it's going to not be payment, strictly speaking, it's going to be uh, transit, or uh, China transit. Um, so that's really the, uh, the area I'm going to zoom into. I, I think um, I've been involved in NFC for about six years, and I think the two scalable applications are the, are the two where there are large infrastructure deployments of payment and transit. China is absolutely on fire at the moment with payment because Apple Pay announced, Samsung announced the next day, Huawei did it three days later. So there's a lot going on in payment, but I'm really going to focus on transit on the, on the right-hand side here. So we've had 
um, AFC, Automatic Fare Collection System, since the late 90s. Um, so this is a third, fourth generation um, architecture. Um, and in the top 10 cities alone in China, there are about 300 million of these physical cards um, deployed. So if you put that next to 200 million smartphone users in the top 10 cities, you've got this segment of people that use transit habitually that can use it on their smartphone. So <coughs> basically, unlike payment, we have an existing habitual use case. We have um, 400,000 uh, transit uh, acceptance points in China. Next to that, there are 6 million payment acceptance points. So people pretty much understand the benefit of contactless. And what we're doing with mobile is giving them something on top. So the, the days of um, uh, waiting at the gate, um, doing top up, queuing in line, that's all been removed. We can, um, uh, on the phone, download the card, we can top up, and basically we allow, <coughs> uh, really to focus on uh, just accepting the gate. So these services, um, not just PowerPoint, this is very much happening today. So we've announced the uh, Shenzhen Transit City uh, just in the last uh, uh, one month. We have uh, Guangzhou launching. So we expect to see um, really very large scale deployments um, supported with consumer marketing campaigns in these top 10 cities. And I'm quite convinced this will, next to the excitement of payment in China, really drive uh, very fast um, deployments in a large scale. Kieran, maybe this one back on. Um, can you just maybe touch on, was one of the topics was um, what I think is really unique is how sort of the phone makers together with the transit city in terms of really focusing on activation. Because I think what we, you know, we've seen many, many stops and starts of different things, but I think somewhat unique with the five or six phone makers and the cities that are going in, how they're really gonna focus on what, what kind of activation rates can they get? Yeah, so the, I think the activation rate on the physical card is probably in the 90% plus range already. Um, and knowing the, um, just the sheer volume of, um, of users, I think um, typically an OEM, a device maker, is looking at at least sort of 10, 20%. That, that kind of makes it a, a hit product or a, or a key feature. Um, and, and I think with the um, the skin and the advertising that they're putting into that. Um, so for example, at these launch events, the great thing about transit, unlike payment, is that actually it's quite, from a Marcom point of view, easy to target the, con the passenger because um, of the location of the gates. There's lots of concentration points. So um, these are additional methods to drive up activation rates. Um, but I think there's um, you know, a potential for 40, 50% activation rates um, on, on a sustainable basis. Great, now let's hear a, a, a really uh, cool, innovative, uh, so we work in a while with you guys, but we'd love to hear more from James on uh, what's going on with the NIMI device. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you've heard uh, this morning a little bit about, uh, about seamless transactions, and obviously the payment space security is a massive issue. It's been reported that uh, fraud around transactions is around nine billion a year. It's a big number for a lot of people. Um, how do you make a seamless transaction possible while uh, making sure that you've got a secure transaction? Uh, well, that's where, that's where NIMI factors in. Um, you may not have heard of us, but we are, a, we are a biometric authentication technology company. And we produce a device called the NIMI Band, currently available in a developer kit. Um, it might be up on screen because we have a small one here that Jeff will show. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, thank you. But what the device does is it's able to use a biometric, our particular modality of biometric that, that we employ currently is the primary method, is your heartbeat. It's an ECG signal, unique to everybody, much like a fingerprint, but we also support other, other modalities. And with that modality, once you've activated the device, you are able to uh, put it into an authenticated state, and that authenticated state stays continuous for the time that you wear it. Okay. 
So around friction in transactions, we see it every day. Passwords, tokens, um, you know, second factor, authentication. Well, what happens every time you use those? Is it friction to you? How can we eliminate that friction? How can we eliminate that transaction? And getting back here. Well rehearsed. Anyways. Okay, well, we don't have our slides up right now. We'll catch up a bit. But what we've done is we've been able to move all that friction to the point that you put our device on. You put the device on, you authenticate to it. It stays authenticated for the duration that you wear the, wear the device. I'll jump ahead here. Um, the advantage is then you have a continuous authentication sphere around you. It's a sphere of trust. It, hence, anything that you want to enroll with and, and interact with on proximity, you can do so and provide that degree of trust and not need a password, not need a second factor. In this case, around payments, you can do a contactless payment based on your biometric authentication. So what we accomplished last year in partnership with, with MasterCard and NXP is we did, followed the, the model that Jeff's talked about, taking a credit card, tokenizing it, and placing it on our band as a, using the biometric modality to turn the credit card on and off. What's the brilliance to this? It means that if someone else gets your band, they're not gonna be able to use it. You have to completely wipe the band to reuse it uh, with, a different, with a different biometric, different person. Therefore, the credit card credential becomes useless. As a result of this, uh, we actually put a number of pilots into the field yes, uh, last year in Canada. We accomplished the first uh, biometrically authenticated contactless payment using a person's heartbeat. And we've had both enterprise and consumers using the device. And the feedback has been rather phenomenal. The trust that you can have in a contactless payment when you know that it's your biometric authenticating it changes the equation about how you can perceive the entire transaction. People may be familiar with a card present or card pres not present transaction. What happens when you can talk about card holder presence? It changes the risk profile. It changes the confidence that everybody has in the entire ecosystem. Um, we also found it very interesting, the convenience factor, putting it in a wearable device. You know, there are other wearables out there that are, uh, have mobile payment enabled, to tokenization enabled, but having a, a wearable on a body so you don't have to reach for your wallet, you don't have to necessarily reach for your phone, changes how people actually interact with their payment terminals. Um, we have a couple uh, snippets of, of feedback that we got through our, our pilots, and it was really resounding how con the convenience factor changed how people actually engaged with the terminals. So, so lastly, just to uh, close with the idea of this consistent sphere of trust around you based on your biometric. You don't have to remember a, a password, token, anything else, and how that can move with you through your daily life, through financial transactions, at your workplace, through HID uh, access or other, other uh, contactless access points, through transit applications, and as well into your home environment with the Internet of Things. Thanks, James. Um, I think that's about it for, for our time or that we've got. Um, I think that for what we hope to, to try and identify is um, realize that there is a lot of technology that's already out there and it's, it's very much right in the rails of proven technology. As Kieran mentioned, he didn't give his whole history. He was actually one who helped implement many of those transit systems in China um, a while back. Um, but I think it's even here in Las Vegas, you can see things. How many of you waited for a monorail ticket to buy a ticket? Uh, especially yesterday morning, and the, the length of line. So the ability to do that at check-in, to be able to put your room key on your mobile device or on your um, wearable device, um, those things are all very technically possible today. They're very safe. They're very secure. The challenge is getting companies like these two to really be able to go out and push them. And, and it largely has to be in conjunction with the big players, the Samsungs, the Androids, and the Apples of the world. But um, I think, again, my, my focus that, that we're seeing is we need to get consumers to understand more of what's possible, better education as to how it works, because I think that's really how the demand gets driven. There was a, probably three, four years ago, and someone said there was an article about nobody wants a mobile wallet because consumers aren't demanding it. And I would argue it's because most consumers didn't know really what it was or what it existed or how it would work. The concept of using an $800 device to be better technically, safer, more secure, um, should be so intuitive, yet I think very often, the fear is that by putting something on a mobile device, it's somehow less secure than my mag stripe. And that, that to me is a hurdle that I think the entire industry uh, needs to focus on, on top of 
where it is working and where it's there, make sure everybody knows that uh, it's something that's possible. And, and like I said, China Transit is probably one of the biggest opportunities and, and the biggest areas where we expect the biggest growth in the coming months. So, great. With that, thank you very much. Thank our panelists. Yep.